Well, I think uh, pluralism is under challenge in Europe in a very big way, perhaps more so than we've seen for many years. Uh, you see it across the continent. You see it in the UK, obviously, with uh, Brexit, where one of the elements, for example, uh, in the vote to leave the EU was a sense that Britain wanted to pull back from, uh, from being uh, jointly uh, governed from Brussels, uh, immigration and a rising feeling uh, that was hostile to immigration was also an element in that vote. So there's an example right away of how a kind of commitment to pluralism was being undermined by uh, public votes. Uh, so, and you can see that elsewhere. If you look at the Nordic countries, for example, uh, you have anti-immigrant parties who have taken quite a tough stance against policies of incumbent governments that have previously been very open and generous towards uh, refugees and migrants from uh, different areas, uh, injecting into the political discourse quite a hostile uh, element uh, and gaining uh, positions uh, in Parliament which give them quite a lot of influence over, over policy and government forming. So even in a country like Sweden, for example, where the uh, party, uh, the Sweden Democrats, which is a, a, essentially a, a kind of party that wants to control immigration in quite an aggressive way, came third in the election and now has a bunch of seats in the Parliament, which means it almost holds the balance of power. So, uh, and, and you can look at that across the, across the continent. If you go to Italy, uh, there is now a government formed by La Liga and the Five Star Movement. La Liga, again, is a, a quite uh, strongly, openly anti-immigrant uh, party that has said we need to close the doors uh, too much. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a kind of political discourse across Europe now which is um, going in the opposite direction to a kind of clearly pluralistic message in a way that we haven't seen for quite a number of years. What you can clearly see is common themes across Europe. So you, know, you have Brexit in the UK, you have the Gilets Jaunes movement in France, you have the rise of the Alternative for Deutschland party in Germany. Um, but I think what you can see underneath these differences between how this manifests itself in different countries are common themes. Um, Immigration is, is one of them, a kind of feeling that people feel somehow threatened by a rise in immigration, which came to a, a peak in 2015 when the Syrian crisis produced this huge number of people who were coming to Europe seeking refuge, and that provoked a, a big backlash. Um, so other themes are on the economy. I think we, there's pretty broad agreement that certainly since the financial crisis, and actually probably before that, you were seeing uh, uh, a development in the economy where, to put it in kind of simple terms, the rich were getting richer, but the poor were not getting richer, and in some cases they were getting poorer. So there was a kind of inequality of outcome in the economy, which I think was also feeding into some of these tensions. And that fed back into, that partly explains the hostility to immigration, because people were looking around and seeing people coming into the country from abroad and saying, well, hey, you know, my job doesn't pay enough to, for me to make a living, and now there's these other people coming in from elsewhere, and they're willing to work for even lower wages, where does that leave me? Plus, they want places in, their school for their, in, in our schools for their kids, they need somewhere to live, they're taking up space in the hospitals, and that, you know, that kind of uh, drives this, this, uh, this kind of more sort of popular discontent that we've, we've seen across Europe in different countries. Well, I think it's very difficult, and I think we're still in a phase where uh, political leaders are still adjusting to this very fundamental change in the, in the kind of accepted wisdom about you know, what the political forces at large were. I think Brexit, the Gilets Jaunes, um, the rise of the AfD in Germany and so on, they, these have been political shocks which the political establishment is trying to come to terms with. And indeed, in some countries, the old political establishment has been completely exploded. If you look in France, for example, which has essentially been ruled since the 1950s by two parties, the Socialist Party on the left or the, uh, the centre-right uh, party, latterly the, the, the UMP, and uh, now they've changed their name again. Uh, but the, the two uh, forces that were the governing parties of France now are 
completely fragmented and they're finding it very difficult to get any kind of purchase in the polls. So I think what you're seeing at the moment is uh, a period, a phase in which the, as it were, the traditional parties are trying to figure out how to respond to this. And in the meanwhile, they've been kind of overtaken in terms of dynamics and momentum by the populist parties that are representing this discontent in quite an aggressive way. So uh, I think what there is now is a huge challenge for those who represent, uh, if you like, a, a more traditional um, pluralistic approach who uh, want to be a, a more encompassing open, have more encompassing open political ethic. Uh, it's a big challenge for them as to how to translate that into a political message that will draw back some of this support and will, uh, as it were, take sort of neutralize some of this uh, quite toxic discontent which is swirling around the continent right now. I think, <clears throat> personally, I think it's going to take a little bit of time uh, and when it's not clear what the outcome is, is going to be. It, it's not it's not all a gloomy picture. Uh, if you look at France, where Emmanuel Macron was elected on a very uh, pro-European, uh, pro uh, sort of pluralistic values platform, uh, very much in favour of international cooperation, the global uh, international order, uh, uh, very much in favour of, um, uh, as it were, a, a, an open uh, society, uh, an inclusive society. His message was was very clear on all of those things, uh, and he, he he won the presidency. Uh, he's only two years into his term. He is facing uh, qu quite a strong opposition, which is you know, symbolised uh, by the gilets jaunes. Um, but who's to say he won't get re-elected? And he's trying to feel his way. Uh, one of the interesting things that he's done in reaction to the uprising from the gilets jaunes was to hold this grand débat where. For several months, they had a kind of national conversation about the political direction that the country should take that would in some way encompass all these discontents and, and, uh, and come to terms with them and offer a way forward that people could buy into in a, in a much more uh, unified way, if you like. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out. So I think, as I say, we're in a phase now where what you would have called mainstream politicians uh, who embrace an inclusive message are still fighting to find their feet again and come up with a message that is convincing to, uh, to people that have been kind of drawn away to, to the more extreme messages. I think one of the features of the last few years has been watching the, the, the leaders of the traditional parties really floundering and really shocked by what's happening around them and they find it very difficult to respond and what they've realized is actually they got a little bit out of touch they just weren't in they weren't really connected in the way that they thought they were and should have been to what was going on in the minds of many of their uh, much of their electorate and so as i said there is a, a kind of great effort to try to reconnect and I think a lot of that comes through the issue of economic policy because an awful lot of this does come back to you know how well you know how people feel they're doing in their daily lives in terms of are you feeling better off are you feeling that your children are going to have an opportunity to get a good job and build a nice you know a good life are your children going to be at least as well off if not better off than the previous generation uh, are you going to have to you know are you worrying about the fin du mois as the uh, as they say in France you know the end of the month is is there still going to be enough to get by before the next paycheck comes in so i think it's a lot of those types of issues which um, politicians who want to continue to espouse a more inclusive uh, politics and a more inclusive message have got to get their heads around and they've got to find ways of making that uh, message uh, get across it's difficult because the whole uh, sort of push of politics after the financial crisis in Europe was we have to put the house in order, you know, there's big debt crisis, we have to cut spending here, we have to cut spending there, and of course welfare spending, for example, was, was a, a big target, it was certainly a big target in the United Kingdom, uh, and those were the very sorts of programs, those sorts of uh, fiscal programs which um, hit a lot of uh, people in the pocket and contributed to this disaffection. And so I think we, what we can see is there's definitely the beginnings, more than the beginnings, of a bit of a rethink on fiscal policy, on tax and spend. Uh, are we uh, 
uh, have we got the balance right? Do we actually need to, to spend a bit more to make sure people uh, uh, are, you know, have a safety net and the safety net is secure and, and make people feel less economically vulnerable? The other thing, of course, which happened was uh, on the monetary policy side, the central banks, uh, in order to keep the economies afloat, did what we know as quantitative easing, where they basically pumped money into the economy. But the effect of that was to uh, push up asset prices, house prices, pro stocks and shares, government bonds, all those things. And so what happened was the people that had assets benefited, they got better off. But the people that didn't have assets, if you rented your house, uh, if, you, uh, you know, if you didn't have a pension or you didn't have stocks and shares, um, you, didn't, you, you went backwards, uh, or at least you tread, tread water at best. Whereas those that had assets got richer. And so they, again, this exacerbated this kind of us and them, rich and poor. And you see, for example, uh, quite a big split, and this is common in, in many parts of Europe, between the relatively prosperous big cities and the much less prosperous uh, small towns and rural areas. And there's, for example, in France, that's where the real divide was. That's where the Gilets Jaunes sprang up from. It was from the... Uh, lower income, less well-off uh, people who were living in the rural areas and the small towns around France who were hit with a tax on, on diesel. And these were people that needed their cars to go to work because there wasn't any public transport, for example. And it, it just flipped them. Uh, and it's that kind of thing that I think the uh, kind of political leadership and the incumbents have got to come to terms with and find a new way and a new balance. I think, it's a, I think nationalism is another issue which political leaders are trying to come to terms with. We had got used to the idea that it was kind of accepted in Europe that, that countries shared sovereignty, that you pooled some of your sovereignty into the European Union in, 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 in the uh, interests of the greater good, and that what you got back from that was um, you know, safety nets of all, all kinds, whether it was security, economic, uh, social. Uh, etc. And that's been uh, undermined. And so you have seen um, an uprise of much more nationalist politics. Uh, you see it in, uh, you see it in, um, you see it in Italy, you see it in Hungary, you see it in Poland, you see it, you see it even in the United Kingdom where the Scottish National Party is pushing very hard for Scottish independence. You have to be a little bit careful about uh, how you judge the nationalist issue in Europe because uh, it's not, it's not a, a kind of purely regressive uh, stream in some, in, in some terms. Um, although it is definitely um, picking away at the stitching that holds together the European Union. But it's, it's a, you, you have to be aware of the nuances. So you will have you know, more uh, kind of raw, aggressive nationalism, which is very much us, you know, against the other. We want to close the doors, pull back in. We don't want these foreigners coming here anymore. We've got far too many. You, you, know, you get that kind of nationalism. But you also get a kind of nationalism, for example, in Scotland, where you know, Scotland voted to stay in the EU, uh, not to leave the EU by a large majority. And the Scottish National Party, which is campaigning for independence and which is the government in, 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 in the Scottish Parliament, um, espouse a very inclusive uh, message. The, their vision of Scottish independence is very much an open, inclusive vision, partly because the Scottish economy needs immigration and everybody knows it. So, so Scotland is ho horrified by the idea that leaving the EU might shut the door to people coming from Europe to live and work in Scotland because Scotland needs more people. And so there are nuances there. Uh, and, and so Yes, there is nationalist politics in Europe, which is, uh, in, in some places, quite toxic. But there are also, uh, the, you, know, you, have, you have to be a little bit careful that there are also uh, p politics of, of, of independence and, and national politics, which is actually uh, looking to be, to embrace an inclusive type of uh, more plural uh, society. I think you can see a number of movements in Europe who are trying to, uh, to get some purchase uh, f for an inclusive, more pluralistic politics, let's put it that way. One of them might be the Green Movement, uh, 
Uh, the problem for the green movement is that their cause is the environment, self-evidently, uh, and therefore it's slightly difficult for them to compete uh, in, on, on, on a broader platform, uh, say, for example, on economic policy, uh, that is, a clearly, is more clearly defined. Uh, so I think at the moment it is, it is difficult to see where the, if you like, the sort of pushback is coming from, but... Uh, You've got the Greens. Uh, you might, I might say that, for example, in Germany, the Green Party is polling at least even sometimes ahead of the Social Democratic Party, which was the traditional party of the centre-left. So that, that, partly, uh, that, that sort of partly is evidence of, of, of what I was saying. Um, in other countries, for example, in Ireland, uh, a smaller country which has faced the threat of Brexit, because Brexit is a, a big challenge for, for Ireland and particularly the Irish economy. There you have seen uh, the politics uh, of inclusion gaining ground, I would say. Uh, they had the referendum um, recently on uh, gay marriage, uh, which was passed. This is in a country that was always identified for years as being very strongly uh, kind of in the pocket of the Roman Catholic Church. And, and yet Ireland voted very much against the teachings of the church in embracing, uh, embracing uh, gay marriage. Uh, they also had a referendum recently uh, to uh, extend uh, the right to abortion. And that was also passed. So, you know, you can see areas where and places where uh, the politics is not all just about uh, rejection and exclusion and us against them. There, there are, there are um, points of light, if you like, uh, in Europe that you can find. Oh, I think there's no doubt that it's no good just putting up the defences and finding ways to neutralise malign influences in social media and so on. I think you have to do much more than that. Uh, and clearly, it, it comes down to education. Um, and I think that uh, that's something that societies, governments, countries need to concentrate on is getting in at the bottom, as it were, and looking very closely at their education programs and the way that these types of issues are framed right through the, uh, the, the sort of school curriculum and, and, and on, uh, because that seems to me to be a way in which you start to build the, you know, you put in the building blocks of a much more, um, a, a much more soundly built and much more resilient, much more resistant uh, acceptance of, of inclusivity in society. You know, um, whoever came across a racist two-year-old, I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't, th <laughs> maybe it exists, but, but it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine. So it seems to me that, you know, we need to look closely at the way in which in, in all societies, these types of um, exclusionist uh, and sort of hostile attitudes develop and, and look, at how, look at ways of how to deal with that. It's not easy. It really isn't easy. Um, because if you take, for example, the Brexit vote, one of the clear reasons why people voted for Brexit was because in some areas they, they did feel that their traditional communities were being, uh, were being changed out of recognition. You know, and, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of the, if you looked at the Brexit vote demographically, uh, there was a preponderance of uh, leave votes, people that voted to leave to people who voted for Brexit tended to be older. And that was no coincidence because these were people who had seen their towns change. Um, you know, instead of the butcher run by, you know, Mr. Tompkins for years and years and years, He'd shut down, disappear, and then there'd be a halal butcher would open up to serve the Muslim community. Uh, and, you know, maybe somebody else's grocery store shut down, and a year later, somebody opens a Polish shop. You know, this, this has happened in our high streets. There's no, you, you mustn't deny it. It's, it's a fact. These things have happened. And some people find this very uncomfortable, and, and you know, they, don't, they don't like it, and they've reacted against it. So, you know, there's a lot of work to do to to you know, counter that in a, in a positive way. And, and the younger generation coming through is probably where you start because there's not much, you know, the old people like me, the over 60s, you know, they're not probably gonna change their mind on those kinds of things very easily. But it's very sensitive and it's very difficult.
Well, I think the evidence is absolutely clear that it's impacting in a negative way. There's no doubt about that. Um, social media is undoubtedly a channel for uh, all kinds of um, conspiracy theories, uh, misinformation, you know, famously fake news, uh, in quite a um, insidious way. Um, and you know, we're dealing with something that we've, we've never dealt with in terms of the sheer volume of information that is out there and the accessibility. You know, anybody can go online and pick up who knows what. Uh, so, and, and what has happened, I think, is that it's become self-reinforcing. People uh, start out with a point of view and they look for sources that reinforce their point of view and maybe you know, develop it into a more um, aggressive form, maybe even, of their particular type of politics. And uh, that's very difficult to... Uh, to deal with. It's very difficult to counter. And I think you have to look at that um, at all kinds of levels. Not least, I think you have to look at the way that these social media platforms are structured. And yes, they're all now building up their monitoring and their moderation and uh, finding ways to kind of clamp down on, uh, uh, on uh, unacceptable content. But uh, you kind of feel like they're only just sort of plugging uh, small gaps in the dike and that the, the pressure is still enormous. So there's no doubt that there is an issue there. Governments are, are obviously looking at that and uh, you know, the, the social media companies are coming under pressure and may well face um, more regulation. Um, there's no reason why social media shouldn't be a force for good, on the other hand, if, if only we could find a way of striking, striking the right balance. And I think, you know, again, we're still working out how to react to this. We're still in quite an early phase, actually. Uh, and uh, to think that there will be a solution to this kind of stuff you know, in a very short period of time is probably unrealistic. I think we've got to work towards it. Um, we've got to work out how to structure and regulate social media. We have to, you know, in a way, if you, for example, I work for a traditional news organization that for the first hundred and whatever years of its, of its existence produced a daily newspaper every day. And we publish online, um, but we also are still uh, bound by the laws and uh, uh, rules and regulations uh, that govern your responsibilities as a publisher of news as to you know, what content is acceptable, what's not acceptable. If you, if you, you know, libel somebody, you're subject to the law and you could be taken to court. And uh, the social media platforms are not like that because they say, oh, no, we're not publishers. We're a platform upon which people can then propagate their own uh, opinions, that w whatever it is. Um, and that's a real dilemma because as long as that is the case, it's very hard to regulate in the way that traditional news organizations have been regulated. I think the developments that we've seen over the past few years, the election of Donald Trump, Brexit, the Gilets Jaunes, uh, the rise of the AFD in Germany, I mean, you, you can, what's happened in Italy, you, you can pick examples all over, uh, has been a bit of a shock to what has now come to be called the mainstream media. Because what it did was it illustrated that we, and it is, it is us, you know, I include myself in this, um, we were a little bit complacent, I think, to say the least, about how out of touch we were um, with a lot of these kind of ground swells uh, that politically that were, that were at work out there. And that's, I think, it also it comes, but we have to kind of look in the mirror. Um, I think in the West, particularly, uh, in, in Europe and in the United States and in North America, uh, in Canada as well, we have not been good enough at being a reflection of the societies that we're writing about in terms of our own makeup. You know, it, over the last, certainly over the term of my career, which is 30, 40 years, um, you have seen uh, a concentration in the media of um, media professionals who are uh, almost exclusively now from a college-educated background, um, 
They are very predominantly from the sort of middle classes and wealthier classes. Uh, and let's say it straight out, they tend to be pretty monochrome. Uh, you know, we've also had over the years a gender equality issue in the media. And you put all those things together and you know, I think we have to be quite self-critical and we have to realize that if we're going to stay in touch and represent and, and be a voice for uh, people across societies that we report on, we've got, to, we've got to look and be much more like them and then we've got to be out there reporting about them. I think that is starting to happen in you know, a significant way. Uh, it's uh, not too soon. You know, it, really, it really, I think you know, we have to be pretty clear that we have not been good enough at that. We've often talked quite a good game about the importance of diversity in the media. I don't think we've delivered. I really don't. Um, and I think there is now a much, I think we are now in a phase where there's a, there really is a, a genuine push. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done on that in that respect. And I think you know, that can make a difference. Because one of the things that you get over and over again when you talk to people about you know, why they voted for Brexit or why they put on the gilet jaune and went to the, you know, the rond-point and started demonstrating is that uh, they've totally lost faith in what they're being told by the, by the quote-unquote mainstream media. They don't believe it anymore. And that's very frustrating for us because we think we are still uh, exerting the same kinds of standards of proof and fact-finding and fact-checking and you know, presenting information and news that is accurate and reliable. But they don't see it that way. And that's a very big problem. We think, oh, well, that's a problem for them because they're stupid. They're not, you know, well, what's happened to these people? Why don't they understand better? But actually, it's our problem as much as it's their problem, if it is a problem for them. I mean, definitely a problem for us. We have to ask ourselves, well, how did we lose this trust? And, and, and are we actually as, as, as fair and open-minded and, uh, and as inclusive as we thought we were? Or actually, were we a little bit in a bubble? Uh, and that, of course, that's the same thing that a lot of politicians uh, from mainstream parties are asking themselves these days. But I think that's a very real issue. Uh, and it, it is n absolutely not too soon. Uh, it's, it's actually rather late in the day to be starting to really kind of address these issues. But I think they are being addressed now. Um, but whether it's, you know, whether we'll be able to really regain that trust, I think, again, it's something that won't happen quickly. It'll take time. It's, it's very easy to lose trust. It's much more difficult to build it up.